Hello everyone, today we talk about the Varangian Guard from 988 to 1066, uh, two arbitrary dates actually that we will be explaining now in a while, as the first video of a series that will include first of all other two videos about the Varangian Guard organization, such as this one, the next one will be fundamentally from the, uh, in fact, after 1066 and we'll explain why, um, up to I think the Fourth Crusade. Uh, easily and another one about the Varangians up to actually 1453 proper. We will explain why we make this division. A lot of things changed throughout this time and at least another video about the Varangian equipment. Right, and this is just for the Varangian guard proper. Actually we will have to talk about the Kievan Rus in, uh, in detail which uh, we have never done yet. Uh, in fact this is the first video on the Varangian guard in the first place. Uh, as well, in which we will also give uh, a bit of uh, background, because naturally I think popular attention revolved mostly around the, the concept of the of the guard, right, of the elite, uh, of these famed, stereotypically represented with two-handed axes, but the Varangians weren't just that, you know, there is a, a much larger participation actually in the, uh, in the imperial army, uh, in the Byzantine world, uh, even just as regular soldiers slash uh, mercenaries, even as garrisons, even as settlers, we can we can uh, assume, and uh, therefore this is a broad chapter that has to take into consideration a, a lot of aspects that are not simply like, you know, uh, a unique channel, a unique track, but as we will see today, for example, uh, the initial tensions with uh, the, the Kievan Rus, most famously, that invaded the empire and eventually started to provide mercenaries, as many other peoples naturally uh, designed, and eventually the growth of this elite unit of the guard as a guard regiment that, as a matter of fact, we don't even exactly know when it was uh, established as such. We know a very few about its organization. Here I've put 988 because uh, it is, you know, conventionally the time in which at least, as you know, in the, the civil wars that afflicted the empire, Basil and the second would be helped by, the, uh, by Vladimir uh, the Great of, of Russia with this very consistent army of, uh, in fact, uh, Varangian troops that eventually remained as a kind of a critical core within the uh, sp specifically as a guard and as an army more than that under the control of Basil the Second for his uh, centralizing policy this idea that naturally foreign mercenaries like in many other uh, contexts were made very good uh, guards as they were not at least uh, originally um, you know in involved into the various local plots and conspiracies and they were distant from the local aristocracies and populist and ideal for for emperors. This is something you can't find uh, historically speaking in the same Roman Empire. Think about the German uh, Equites Corporis Custodes of, of Augustus or you know any other, even, even the Muslims used for example Christian bodyguards at this point so um, this is quite fascinating and we will extend naturally at some point with other videos on those topics as well but what I think is overlooked about the Varangians uh, in the Byzantine Empire is in fact how much they were spread aside from the guard regiment right and also how this was somewhat more articulated than just, in fact, as we were saying, the stereotypical, for example, infantry, right? Surely they made an excellent infantry, but we know perfectly well they, they knew how to, to fight uh, on horseback pretty well. Uh, they were also equipped with very different weapons. There is a bit of, you know, uh, unflexible mindedness about this fact. For example, uh, here I read uh, even a bit from experts that uh, deny the, the existence of other types of weapons, such as, you know, the Byzantine what the Byzantines, of course, through atticistic reference, called to ad addressed as Romphaya, the ancient Balkanic falxes. But if you look, for example, at the Grettir saga, you find something called as the Aptisax, you know, described as fundamentally as a very long sword with a single edge, uh, with a long uh, wooden shaft, and uh, this might have as well easily been something that is to be found even in other, uh, with other parallelisms in Beowulf, for example, in other sagas, um, and uh, generally speaking in the panoply of uh, warriors throughout uh, throughout Eurasia, as probably something could look like a falx, right? Even certain hybrids between the saxes that sometimes could reach very long 
uh, sizes surely the um, the the Varangians were equipped with. So there was actually a this were this this were not just a picked bodyguard unit. This were properly an army within the army, and this should be contextualized naturally in the military organization of, of the Roman Empire at the time concerning the, the split that had taken place chiefly by the, the, the 10th century, the important military reforms between the probably the imperial, we can say even Constantinopolitan army, right? Also the Varangians were quite, you know, uh, stereotypically attached to Constantinople, probably as the guard um, of the city. Uh, but of course, they were used um, everywhere in campaign chiefly, but not only, um, and the provincial armies, right? which reflects the, the distrust of of emperors in general in their centralizing attempt of the in fact the provincial armies um, all over the empire was at this point being re expanded remarkably, and therefore uh, this is just from the Byzantine side, and from the other side there is the major chapter of the creation of uh, the the Kievan Rus. Uh, the, the split, as we will see later, properly from that chan not much from the channel, geographically speaking, but, you know, properly with the extraction of these peoples, right, you know, at some point the Byzantine sources start differentiating, for example, between the Ross and the Varangine, it's proper, and we'll see now also what these terms mean, indicating that it was properly a, at some point a, a Russian and a, and a Norse uh, background that was distinguished on some occasions, and this naturally has to do a lot with the consolidation of of the Russian principalities, per se. Um, so, you know what the story here in the background is, we have talked about it, we'll come back on it. By the end of the 9th century, the Scandinavians had uh, been attracted into Russia in search, chiefly of uh, forced slaves, um, and more generally also as mercenaries. Right, as freelance um, mercenary units that were put to the service of the local Slavic princes, sometimes managed to take over to marry into the local nobility. Right, you know, some thoughts this is pictured as, you know, Russia turning into a Swedish colony, but it's not properly correct. Theodorov, if you study, you know, this historiographical um, realizations at this point, you know, demonstrated pretty clearly that the Kievan Rus was a Slavic creation, right? That surely the, the, the Norse element contributed to structure it, to, to give it a, a better order. To Generally speaking, when you see all these mercenaries in, in great forces, you know that there, is or, that there are already powers that are capable of paying them. Uh, there are rampant elites that are structuring via these mercenaries, that is, with the military instrument, their control in the territory, right? And properly speaking, these would evolve into Slavic principalities with the Norse element absorbed and surely having an important impact, especially at the beginning, but gradually developing as a military system on their own. And that's also where the detachment properly uh, started from. But it's also a dramatically underdocumented um, era, right? Uh, the, the, the Russian chroniclers of, of later uh, centuries are naturally very oriented towards the, you know, the, the the princely idea of this continuity also in a dynastic sense of this um you know ideological instrument to legitimize uh, a situation that before the mongol invasion wasn't at all let's say fully settled between the princes and, and the middle classes right that eventually were wiped out later being wiped out by the mongol invasion and you know you have the properly the, the, the dynastization of russia in a completely you know completely different world as Russia fundamentally transformed into a, a, a you know, a Tartar vassal, but and, and with all the influences of, of the case, uh, this is a broader problem also properly of the orthodox um, historiographical characters, right, because they, they're highly stylized, highly ideological, uh, highly conceptualized, we know perfectly well, for example, even after the Mongol invasion, Russian art kept depicting um, the, the, his own, you know, warriors in the typical Byzantine fashion, of the iconic fashion, it is a problem that we have actually for, for Constantinople as well, we see a lot of classicism in there, but we don't, you know, archaeology in both cases tells us a, a very different stories and, and Russia by itself was also an incredibly um, diverse and um, you know an enormous just think about extensionally and um, counter influenced by lots of other neighbors that that could actually offer interesting keys of interpretation also for the qualities the peculiar military car um, qualities of the Varangian guard as such and not just this stereotypical thing of the infantry two handed axes but something more than that, right?
And even here, there are lots of parallelisms, even with Anglo-Saxon England, with you know the late Viking uh, military developments, and and so on. Um, especially in terms of cavalry, that stereotypically, you know, in the north, it's saying, ah, oh, they didn't have much of a cavalry in there. Yes, they surely didn't have something, you know, fully professionalized and structuralized, and, you know, qualitative as the the Frankish vassalatic beneficiary system was producing. Uh, at the time, but surely they weren't like just preferably fighting on foot, right? There was actually an enormous deal of, of cavalry development in those areas, and also lots of it. And about the timeline here, uh, I already explained the 988, right? So with, we think properly that this massive injection of uh, Varangian slash Russian would be somewhat interchangeable at some point. And especially at that point, it's more like Russians injected into the um, into the the Byzantine army, right? In 1066, because of uh, a gradual development of this and kind of also institutionalization of this regiment, but also uh, the opening of new channels. Remarkably, in fact, the Anglo-Saxon one. All the Anglo-Saxon refugees that were fleeing from the Norman invasion of England, right, uh, came to you know, to Constantinople to make a living. They fought against the Normans in uh, in the Balkans, uh, in Italy, uh, and so on. And um, the, the important here is naturally understanding the, the attractiveness that the empire constituted in the Eastern Mediterranean, as by far Constantinople being the largest city in Europe. Uh, these guys, as we'll see, were paid extremely well, right, and gaining to very high offices that could interfere also with Byzantine politics. And society, right? Harald Ertrada is uh, that we will see have Harald Sigurdsson having uh, later king of Norway between 1046 and 1066, having been uh, considered the the richest man ever uh, existed up to that point in uh, uh, in northern Europe because of all the wealth that he had accumulated at the service of Constantinople. There was a lot of economical interest. Harald, for example, um, you know uh, in the maintained his uh, all these precious metals or all his money uh, in um, probably in Kiev, right? Not in Constantinople. At some point, he was even prohibited to come back, right? You know, he became an important political figure. The, the emperors wanted to control him um, in many ways, but there was a lot of the, in this whole picture, and we come fundamentally at the end, 1066, at least conventionally, of the uh, Viking era, we see this constant uh, connection uh, via Russia, between Scandinavia and the Black Sea and, and Constantinople, uh, and through that, basically through the entire Mediterranean and beyond, right? And the Varangian Guard is mm, perhaps the best um, indicator of the spread of the Northmen, and also Trade d'Union, I would say, with the later Frankish uh, uh, Latin uh, mercenaries that were appearing, it also would open, you know, the way to the Crusades as essentially a Western presence in the Near East that f by far predated the Crusades and that, as you know, we made a lot of video about in referring specifically to the military achievements also of, of the Franks in those occasions as just not new newcomers, but people that had known by that time what uh, what the world was, was really. And there are dramatically fascinating connections. Think about the, uh, the Varangian stones, right? Overwhelmingly concentrated in Sweden. There's something a lot, you know, consistent amount, some hundreds in, in Denmark as well, in Norway, and so on. That are runes that, uh, you know, in, in many cases show the, uh, essentially, the, the memory of those warriors that had died chiefly in this broad east. It was most of the time Russia, but we have a specific reference to Constantinople, to Italy, to uh, all areas in which, you know, this, this young man fundamentally from, from Scandinavia went to, to make a living, you know, some are pretty brutal and bloody ones, in which many naturally died, but some would also come back from, um, as a kind of, uh, you know, a natural thing. Uh, at certain points, Sweden being renowningly at this time, you know, the, actually the most unstable of the various, um, you know, of the, of the Scandinavian uh, kingdoms here. It's even difficult to speak about it in, in those terms for Sweden, but that was extremely dynamic in many ways, had a lot of trade connections, a lot of influences we know from the border step, from, you know, that military technology, that world, that mindset, that culture. And we find amazing um, 
cultural intersection in there in terms of military capacities. The main Russian centers in which the Varangians settled were naturally uh, Novgorod, uh, then through on the middle Dnieper River at Kiev, that would arise as the major um, power, and uh, allegedly was a broader unification of these domains that actually was never accomplished and surely you know didn't uh, evolve over time because this started development as all separated centers and maintained a, a broader connection but just for mostly economical interests and always trying you know to you know, to prevaricate one another um, and uh, at that point as we've seen the Roman Empire was the, the greatest uh, state uh, in Europe easily right you know it was best organized the richest the most military uh, powerful and it has the, this unique uh, position for which naturally think just about the Bosphorus, how to oblige those who wanted to pass from, from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean and opening to their traffic is not very different from today. Think about, you know, uh, Russia and Turkey always having this, you know, uh, 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 subtle hostility even when they're namely uh, allied, but actually, you know, very, they're being distrustful towards one another that uh, made Constantinople the necessary passage point for the uh, for the Varangians, their Varangian uh, road, as it was called, the road of the Varangians to the Greeks, right? And this is mentioned naturally in, in many in many sources, and this area naturally was open to, to a much broader spectrum. Think about it, up to the Caspian Sea, the you know the central routes, uh, uh, Central Asian routes of of the Silk Road. Uh, there are extremely fascinating. Uh, theaters that at some point will have to scope in, in detail and who were actually the Russians and the Varangians because they carved out these uh, they say better the Russians slash Varangians at the, especially at the beginning you know as they carved out this space that initially you know conflicted with Constantinople but just eventually you know uniting in, in, in alliance and in this broader uh, political interests namely you know the, the fight against the patch and exile as other um, powers in the uh, in the Eurasian um, uh, um, border, let's say fr frontier, um, and the, the the name Rus or Ross, right, is, is still debated, um, and it seems uh, properly a Finnic Estonian term uh, connected to the uh, the etymology of those who rowed, right, the rowers, uh, which you know is a good way of you know picturing the Vikings if you want along the great uh, Russian rivers. Um, the Varangians Varyag, Varagu, Varengar were, you know, yet another thing. Um, the the, war, the the etymology of Varangian seems to come from, from Var, which means confidence, woe, fidelity, right? Uh, think about the Varing or the Veringi uh, in, in Proto-Norse. So, essentially the, those brotherhoods, right, of, of warriors that had sworn oaths of allegiance and fellowship you know, look at the Germanic prototype uh, Verganga, right? That in many uh, even juridical mm, systems of continental Europe uh, indicated uh, the foreigner, right? If you look at, I don't know, the Longobard uh, laws, that, that's how it financially went. But it's something more eventually that, especially in, in Constantinople, assumes a, a specific semantic. Uh, meaning that is the, the, the foreigner that, yeah, he has been taken to service. Uh, by a, uh, a lord through a contract of field and still indicating etymologically how and this is confirmed by Byzantine sources the fact that these were properly these weren't scattered troops they were properly entire blocks of, of uh, entire armies right small or even larger armies that were uh, even uh, autonomously administrated after they had been hired and settled in the empire right this is this is quite fascinating uh, there was a in fact, the maintaining of this critical core of uh, of the Rangians, uh on the long run, uh, and uh, naturally the initial relations with the new Rome and the Scandinavians weren't easy, right? You know, they were essentially trade and war, right? These were pirates, as well, that's fundamentally what the Vikings were, and uh, the Rush, the Rus would launch attacks, famously enough on Constantinople herself in 860 in 1043. And this, is, this was the moment in which the Vikings and the Slavic populations in Russia were still assimilating and structuring this um, raising powers were fastly uh, 
growing thanks to to, to this activity of uh, of uh, of trade and and uh, raiding and so on. Um, and on the long run, uh, the Vikings began not to you know to, in this sense naturally in, in that mess in that you know political fragmentation and instability that you can imagine. Uh, the standard is that there are these troops everywhere, right? The, the Byzantines began to hire uh, bikes as soon as they appeared. Uh, which is, this is not completely documented, of course, but it's absolutely normal, right? And initially this would happen in small bands, uh, you know, as it had began actually with the same, look at the Carolingian Empire, had started like the same way. Eventually, they, the these Vikings would start to become something something else right and creating now a professional body of of troops that in Byzantine history are to re, re, be remembered in fact one of the most famous corps in uh, in 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 their history but also in military history uh, in general acquiring a great fame and reputation all over uh, Europe and the Mediterranean and uh, the Near East Right, and uh, as we will see now, in fact, these troops were used by the Byzantine army pretty much everywhere. Right, and just think about the school of this. You know, if you look at Aral Tertrada, you understand his his dramatic feats and fame and charisma attached uh, to the military career that he willingly went to. Yeah, uh, you know, for in in Constantinople, also for love reasons, for example, marrying uh, the the Grand Prince's uh, daughter. Uh, in that case, making a freaking lot of money and more in general acquiring this um, truly unique military experience, right? Because naturally, the empire had means that the Scandinavians didn't quite um, couldn't quite afford as political and uh, social uh, realities, and uh, gaining therefore a lot of know-how and you know using the best equipment, the best technologies, um, and naturally bringing also their own what the what the Scandinavians surely mastered at level, uh, mastered at level of, for example, of individual quality, of also naval roles, right? Uh, the, the the Russians were, and here I always am always indecided which which term to use because in, in a way they were it, it's the same thing. Here I would say the Varangians more more often, but you know, uh, their naval capabilities. These were Vikings, right? You know, so they they were let uh, sometimes. Uh, as by the Byzantines in the Eastern Mediterranean operating as pirates to crush other pirates, right? You know, to as as corsairs fun, fundamentally and properly as as marines, as, as sailors, and even in the same actually in the same Imperial Navy sometimes. Um, and the you know the, a body of Russians and Norsemen appeared in the Imperial entourage uh, from the time of Emperor Michael the Third. Right. And we know of numbers of them serving also from the beginning of the 10th century, levied as mm, regular soldiers, like the Stratiotes is the term in the Byzantine army. Um, and they were profitable uh, units at that time because the, the Russians were actually used to fight in this broader, um, let's say, Pontic frontier of of uh, also of the empire against these uh, stabs peoples that after all mm, created the problems to the to, to the Cayman Rus as well as mostly choking the uh, the corridor of uh, southern Ukraine you know you know that from the Eurasian steppes there is this corridor passes arrives fundamentally in the eastern area right on the uh, the, the Danube mouth and then runs uh, under the Carpathians and then arrives in the last great step of Europe that is Hungary, the Pannonian Plain um, and the, the Russians naturally had needed to pass so this is from uh, east to west you know the Russians needed to pass for, for access in the Mediterranean from north to south so they naturally conflicted these traffic and grew dra dramatic uh, skills and you know necessarily so and also developed military systems to fight against this um, uh, horse archers essentially of the steps. This is a chapter now I wouldn't like to digress uh, in because we already made enough videos about that. We never quite addressed uh, the the thing in detail, but you know more or less we're talking about all the fact this ideally kind of more uh, sedentary Slavic element than these other peoples uh, of the steps as you know essentially semi nomads. 
or even completely normal and you know different military solutions development even of certain type of equipment um, uh, in the area and so on about which unfortunately we do not know much right uh, these are you know the the, the, the development of the Cayman was, was a big uh, was a big deal at the time but still its society didn't produce an astonishing amount of, of, of sources and uh, once again we can't digress even in here but we, we don't we're not terribly informed about it. In fact, we are not, as we'll see today, not even for, for the Byzantine Empire that produced an astonishing amount of sources. But um, we do not have to underestimate, even in terms of, you know, of judgment of, of the Varangian capabilities, that, that specific uh, scenario. And the, it, it's likely that the Byzantines first used these troops essentially as as border guards, in a way, you know, as border frontier guards, even maybe settling them in part, because you know, what was the frontier? It wasn't properly like a border, like, and and uh, Constantinople needed mostly to have its northeastern um, frontier secured from that side, um, and um, it was a way, naturally, also to buy off uh, raiders that would have raided in in their lands anyway. So you know, that was. Uh, a policy that the empire had always carried out. From the 60s of the 10th century, the imperial armies counted a lot of Norse and Rus mercenaries, right? Which actually speaks for the conveniency for uh, the, the you know both sides involved, uh, as for the the contractors and the contracted uh, about this deal. And Constantine Porphyrogenitus uh, even mentions in his uh, uh, work in ceremony, a lot of baptized Russians, you know, that there was this uh, gradual Christianization by hands of Orthodox missionaries from Constantinople of the Russian lands. It would be formalized, actually, in, um, in, in, in more than one century. I mean, it started in the second half of the ninth century, mostly, and culminated with the bapti baptism of Vladimir I in, uh, uh, at the end of, of the tenth. Uh, so you can imagine even just the exchange of, you know, of, uh, of of people, of personnel between Constantinople and, and Russia, and this broader uh, contact being remaining always open, you know, for for the soldiers. And um, we know in in this okay from from uh, Constantine Porphyrogenitus actually that the the baptized this baptized Russians at court already figured as a separate company alongside Dalmatians and even as naval guards, right? So times were mature even before the time of, of Basil II properly to of these guys being hired in the army, at court, in the navy, etc. However, 988, we arrive in here, you know, in, nine, in the year before the rebel Bardas Focus had marched on Constantinople, and uh, at this point, Vladimir, Vladimir the Great um, received a request for help from the Emperor Basil II, Perfect Genitus. We, we made actually a video about him, very you know concise, but still you know about the figure that is considered easily actually one of the greatest Roman emperors ever. And Vladimir sent the six thousand men uh, in, uh, that were mostly actually a way to get rid of dangerous uh, troops that uh, in this, you know, uh, Russian principalities were still capable of throwing power, you know, was still consolidating it. So it was one easy way to, to get rid of the, something you find very often, politically speaking, in this eras, to, uh, to bet, actually, at that point on, on Basil. Uh, in fact, these troops arrived uh, in Byzantine territory in the winter 987-988. These troops started defeating uh, the uh, Byzantine rebels in 989 um, uh, at Delphinus, uh, at Scutari, and eventually at uh, the, the most famous Battle of Abydos, when the same Bardas Bocchus died. You know, and his troops were basically cut to pieces by these uh, these Russian mercenaries. Uh, later on, as we have said, Prince the Grand Prince Vladimir converted to Orthodox Christianity, married the Princess Anna of Constantinople and this would change Russian history forever while Basil II was doing his share definitely uh, in the Byzantine Empire.
he brought his Russian troops that had remained at this point. You understand, 6,000 troops here is an army on their own, right? And Basil uh, fought with them uh, in 994 against Syria. Uh, the Russians took part at the capture of Antioch and pillaged as far as Tripoli. Uh, also in 999, Basil besieged and captured the city of Emesa. Uh, and uh, in uh, this uh, occasion, the Rus uh, distinguished themselves for the distractions as well. And uh, still at the turn of the century, uh, some 6,000 Rus accompanied Basil on campaign in Georgia and Albania. Right. This also brought to uh, disorder for which this common, uh, you know, among the, this various, uh, n the same national parties of, of mercenaries that naturally had all their own background and interests in the army at court, etc. The, the Russ and the Georgians started this fight. The Armenian Grand Prince and many others were, were killed. And... Uh, the most important aspect of this is that properly under Basil II, the development of the Imperial Varangian Guard uh, takes shape. At least we find this nucleus of Rus that worked as the Imperial Bodyguard, known as the Varangian Guard, uh, the, uh, the axemen of which became the, the sign of the Emperor's presence on the battlefield. Right, and uh, that, uh, generally speaking, opened as a phenomenon to the further recruitment of Barangians, um, in uh, not just in the guard but in in other uh, parts of the arm. And this, as we were saying before, was a specific uh, goal of Basil to grow independent from the great Byzantine aristocrats with whom he was struggling also for you know the reforms. Uh, of, of land property, of you know the reduction of the Great Latifund in order to save uh, the middle class. So naturally, the mercenaries costed, but it was still a way to uh, maintain a, a more central uh, rule to crush uh, enemies on the various frontiers with greater continuity in the military organization, and simply you know the distancing the emperor from all potential plots, conspiracies connected to to domestic. Uh, policy, and and these troops uh, uh, are to be found actually uh, in most of, of Basil's campaign in Bulgaria, right? And Anatolia, where they were achieved some of the greatest success. You know that at the beginning of the 11th century, Basil carried out these campaigns uh, that lasted for almost 20 years. Were quite tough in in the Balkans against the Bulgarian Tsar Samuel. Uh, chiefly in Greece and Macedonia, but the thing went on also in the Bulgarian uh, heartland. And the presence of the Varangian Guard in these campaigns is attested by many uh, sources, and including actually archaeological ones that have been studied uh, quite recently that uh, you know connected the uh, certain specific finds to at least surely to the Byzantine army, but possibly also. To specifically Norse equipment, uh, in this case, as you know, the uh, the major uh, blow on the Bulgarians arrived in 1014 uh, at uh, Balathista, the, the, the battle Claydon Pass, where uh, the, the Bulgarians were were crushed, and uh, Basil had 15,000 Bulgar prisoners um, blinded nine out of every ten, right, and sent back to to the Tsar that eventually uh, allegedly died because of the, of the only sight of this spectacle and uh, the presence of the Rus on such uh, tough uh, strategic theater that went on uh, like for a long time naturally speaks uh, about their professionalism about the fact that, uh, that the Balkanic frontier was one of the toughest in absolute terms um, and that therefore this was not just like uh, the theater for, uh, especially what there was a lot, a lot of guerrilla going on, ambushes, uh, skirmishes, uh, raiding activities. This is not really the uh, the work for an elite guard, right? That's something you want to keep in reserve for the most critical moments of, of a pitch battle. But th this was a larger body, which likely the Russians, uh, you know, covered simply all the possible uh, 
um, tactical roles, right, and were developing as a permanent professional army, fanatically loyal to the uh, to the emperor. Who actually, after the the the, the fall of the Bulgarian capital Akrida Horid in ten eighteen, at the end of the war, divided the prisoners into three groups and one third uh, was given actually to the Varangians. Right now, as we'll see later, uh, this is naturally a, uh, a bright sign of the Varangian importance at this point, as one third of the Byzantine army depended on, on these troops. In fact, the other third, by the way, was uh, for the emperor, the other for, for the Byzantine soldiers themselves. So this actually equated the Varangians to the uh, Byzantine, uh, native uh, Byzantine element as well. Uh, but uh, this was just one frontier where, where the Russians uh, were, were used. In 1018, for example, in Italy, the Byzantine rebel Melos of Bari uh, confronted the imperial army in several pitched battles, you know, in, in Apulia, by the way, that has very different from Bulgaria, naturally a lot of flatlands, also where cavalry, historically, uh, is quite important, where the Russians obtained a crushing victory against the uh, the, the rebels, and specifically uh, Melos was commanding Longobard and Norman mercenaries, right, uh, the latter under Gilbert Boiter. Uh, so this is an interesting confrontation between actually uh, not so distant uh, relatives, we could say. The Normans were spreading at this time in southern Italy as contractors actually for the Longobard uh, for the Longobard nobility mostly, uh, but not very differently as, in fact, the, the Varangians were doing in the Byzantine Empire. They were part of, of the same broader circuit, actually. And uh, this is interesting also because the Normans were mastering, uh, starting to master the, you know, their cavalry capabilities, for which they would become uh, extremely famous, but it was essentially a Western Frankish uh, system. But nevertheless, uh, the Rus here are able to crush them as well, right? It's not that we have a dramatic um, uh, documentation about the battle, but it's still meaningful about the fact that uh, the Varangians, again, were not tactically limited, right? They knew how to cope in, uh, with every situation. Uh, in 1021, Emperor Basil II led uh, another expedition into Georgia, where the Rus are mentioned for their ferocity, right? They laid waste the countryside. They also took part on the final decisive victory over the Georgians and Abbasians. And after Basil's death, uh, the Varangians were kept being used as their principal imperial bodyguard unit, right? And in 1032, they were once again sent uh, in the east, right? And participated to the famous victory of uh, Georgios Maniakas against Edes, right? And there are sources telling uh, about this event. A Russian envoy to the Emir of Iran sent by, by the Byzantines uh, seemingly lost his temper and struck the Emir with, with an axe, you know, which is kind of very, very stereotypical, but nevertheless kind of plausible. Um, we know in 1040 the presence of a Varangian guard detachment composed by Rus and Scandinavians, here there is the, the separations between the two, uh, led by the uh, famous Harald Hardrada, uh, fighting under the same Maniacus in Sicily, famously enough, and this expedition that uh, you know eventually failed. It didn't quite accomplish uh, a great, a, a long-term strategic result, but it's nevertheless important because it talks also about this pre-existing interference, also Norse, Scandinavian, Norman, whatever you want to call them, elements in, in Sicily before, actually uh, 10 years before the, the invasion of Robert Giscard, right, Arab Sicily. Um, in, on this occasion, the, uh, the, the Scandinavians uh, and the Rus achieved great victory at the Battle of Troina. Harald Ertrada was eventually employed by the Emperor Michael the Paphlagonian against the rebel Delianos in Bulgaria. The year after, 
and for his deeds uh, received uh, he, the title of Spataro Candidatos that we will see later better what it is um, and in um, in this campaign allegedly according to, to the sagas the title of Bulgara Brenner which is actually not different from the one that Basil II had received as the Bulgarian Slayer uh, we have to imagine a lot of actually of um, excitement. Think about all how the skulls produced this works out. This the same actually the same Arald composed um, himself. There was a a great um, hype, generally speaking, from the side of these mercenaries uh, in in Constantinople and at home to 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 sing their deeds in this incredibly rich area where they're striking success one after the other under these uh, in fact properly Norse men that gained prestigious posts in the Byzantine army and even politics, uh, and that therefore were assimilating even, you know, the, the, the idea of greatness that, that the empire embodied, right, that there is this extremely interesting uh, contrast actually between the, you know, one of the most absolute powers uh, in, politically speaking, in in uh, in in Europe, and with the Scandinavians, that actually were one of the le more egalitarian, less stratified ones uh, in the same continent. So, in but you know, this is big, the same dynamic of every empire. Like you know, the, there is the rich empire, this big army needs you know uh, foreign mercenaries to to, uh, as we've seen, essentially. Uh, provide some reliable troops that are not involved in the lo in the intrigues of the local aristocracy. So, where do these people come from? Of course, from the poorer areas, those that you know that produce this uh, more warlike individuals, because th they don't have much uh, another way to 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 survive otherwise, and they they find employment, uh, exploiting this uh, you know putting to service this this quality uh, 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 that is paid pretty well in the great empire and naturally there is all a pride that is uh, developing in parallel with this idea of you know having served under constantinople and this uh grandiose uh system that you, you can't imagine how they they did you know the, the scandinavians called constantinople uh miklagard which i've always thought it was uh actually the uh the great city translated but i found translation also the the, the city of michael thinking about the the archangel i mean this uh, inferic uh, uh, figure, if you want, of the Bible that crushes you know, the the arch enemy of God, and that um, th there are a lot of uh, religious aspects. And here did this, for example, also the Longobards had taken this saint as a you know the, the, their their thing. Uh, incidentally, in the same places where the Normans also fought in southern Italy you know, among these southern Longobards. Uh, for which uh, there was a coincidence of certain religious values, after all, between Christianity and paganism in terms of, of military culture that do not have to be underestimated. We'll see it later also regarding, for example, the military symbolism and the, the banners of the Varangian Guard. There is also another very interesting employment of the Russians in 1054 against uh, the Seljuk Turks, during their, uh, the latter's invasions of Byzantine Armenia by Sultan Togrul Bek, right, at the time of Emperor Constantine the Ninth Mono Monomachos, for which an Armenian historian talks about the Akolutus Mikhail, right, that we will see now, uh, being actually the the commander of the of the imperial bodyguards of Russo-Varangian Druzinas here and Franks, so these were fundamentally Western European mercenaries um, uh, striking uh, an important defeat against the Seljuks, right? The um, actually meeting uh, incidentally uh, with them and uh, defeating the Turks and uh, pillaging their camp, but not pursuing them. By the way, which is a clever thing to do, you know, if you as if you look at the history of Crusades, generally speaking. And we don't know much more about this. We don't know how it really gone, but it's th this is remarkable. And it um, talks about what we're talk we were referring at the beginning, about the uh, reconnection after all of this Russo Varangian element and properly the Frankish, Norman, Western European element that are basically under the same uh within the same ranks. Right here the Normans were spreading, as you know, 
uh, starting to spread in Sicily. They had already seized control of southern Italy. Uh, in a in a few years, they would invade England. Uh, there was a, a broader, and they naturally were connected from Normandy and northern France in general. But by the way, Norman is a synecdoche. Lots of people, lot of Normans, were actually you know other kind of French, German, uh, or Italian troops, right, of, of of different sort. But they were still connected to this broader and active uh, northern. Um, arc, let's say, b- between the, the the North Sea and the, and and the the North and the Baltic Sea, that eventually, as a circle, you know, from Russia they descended into Constantinople, and then then from southern Italy and France, and it went around, right? And there is a lot of exchanges in this sense that I think, in my opinion, are dramatically overlooked, right? The Crusades are often pictured, ah, oh, you know, Westerners coming out all of a sudden. From their, you know, uh, you know, feudal isolation where they didn't know where the rest of the world was. These guys traveled the entire world, right? It's not just the Vikings. This, this is a broader Western uh, European system that is putting itself in motion at so many levels, and that the Crusades themselves represent as a as an unicum, actually. Of and here we arrive to the end of our period. So we will continue actually on about the second half of the eleventh the 12th century in another dedicated video. Let's now t- talk about the the composition properly of the Varangian Guard, right? The uh, first name that uh, appears in medieval Greek attributed to them is Ros, Rossi, right? Uh, at the uh, lattice, right? It calls them uh, in, in classical fashion, you know, in, in the classical elicism of Tauro Scythians, right? So these people that inhabited in the ancient world in the area, the, the Byzantines called them like that, right? You know, Anna Comnena talks about, you know, the, the Franks as the, the, the two, as the Celts, right? You know, that they, they used, after their mind, the Byzantine mindset was, you know, if, if the ancient orders had written that, it's because that is right, and that's always been like that, and that reflects the perfection of our empire, so they, they, uh, they applied these um, uh, anachronisms to, to realities that naturally had changed. And um, they are, in fact, it says the Taurus Scythians, but those who in common speech are called the Rossi, right, in medieval Greek in that kind. So, naturally, it talks about the Rus and suggests the fact that, naturally, the guard was originally drawn specifically from, uh, from, from this broader Russian area, independently from their actual origin, because, as we've seen, there were Norse between them. But uh, there was a later phase in which properly Scandinavians began to join, right, passing to Russia, but not eventually settling there, but simply in order to reach Constantinople. So from, from everywhere, from Norway, from Iceland, right, from Sweden, of course. And, and later on, where we stop today, in fact, with the 11th century, as we've seen, there were lots of, uh, of uh, Anglo-Danish elements, uh, or other Britons, for example, were also Celts. Uh, we don't know, for example, there might have been also Welsh um, elements. Uh, there is, um, in fact, uh, we don't really know because the term Val, as you know, means um, foreigner in, in the Germanic etymology, in part had been absorbed by certain um, sources, and we don't know whether we're to- they're talking about the Welsh that might have gained uh, the name or, or the blacks um, as you know the, the Welsh as the Celtic non Germanic Anglo Saxon element in Britain and the blacks also as you know the uh, essentially Romance people in uh, these uh, in, in between the, the Danube and the Carpathians but surely people from all over the world joined the so called Varangian Guard even Varangian is naturally a synecdoche right you know it's not just, you know, these were only people coming either from Russia or the Scandinavia. It could come from a bit everywhere, as a matter of fact. And as we've seen, there were also lots of Western Europeans at some point mixed in, in the ranks. So what's the difference? Just think about the channels of recruitment. We know, naturally, about the army of 6,000 warriors sent by Vladimir to Basil II. We think they, they may have largely been Norse. However, since... Uh, previously, the same Vladimir had hired uh, a lot of people coming from Norway and Sweden, and that were exactly the ones he wanted to get rid of. So this is also another interesting aspect. It is to say, also those who 
coming from Russia, yes, but were still mercenaries that were used by this now still, as we've seen, essentially Slavic polities um, uh, on a regular base. So initially, and this is fascinating, the sources called these troops mostly Rus and Ross, stressing the the origin, at least, of, of recruitment of these troops from uh, from the Byzantine side. And eventually, uh, they instead start to differentiate between, in fact, the properly Slavic Russians and the Norse. And well, the latter being most commonly called, in fact, Varangoi in Greek, that is Varangians. And, and this term was applied actually to the Norsemen in general. Right? They came, they became, uh, in fact, a synecdoche because it was referred to mercenaries of Norse just even origin or but think about all the you know all the different elements I don't know from you know Finnic Slavic um, origin that simply joined the the, the Vikings in, in their raids in their expeditions right who knows where they were coming from actually there were lots of uh, same Franks in gold that were participating to, to, to Viking raids right uh, even Anglo-Saxons people from basically every place that uh, you know that was invested by the, the Viking uh, invasions, and eventually the you know the, there were other changes in Comanian times in the terminology because the Varangians who were stereotypically the Northmen, in, in, even if they came from somewhere else, right? For example, Liutprand of Cremona was a an Italian order of the tenth century was ambassador of Emperor Otto the first of the Holy Roman Empire to Constantinople wrote that the Russians, whom we call by the other name of Norsemen, right, um, etc., etc. So, um, even in here, one of the two, right, um, and the the distinction is actually important, because once again, Russia was not, like, populated by Norsemen. It was populated by Slavs, largely, but still the military uh, element in there was uh, actively composed by by Northmen on a regular base by, by, a, by an important margin and there are others um, you know other references for example Kelkalmenus Strategicon I don't know if you've ever read it is considered somewhat a minor and actually also later source but it says for example that the uh, at uh, the, the the garrison of Taranto in Italy, the Ross and Varangians are two different units, right? And then there are also later sources that distinguish um, in this sense, really. And the interesting fact about the Varangians is that they maintained actually mm, strong connections with their their motherland, right? It was normal for uh, certain Scandinavian families to. Uh, make the service in the guard as a tradition through the generations, right? There were especially men of of high status, uh, princes, chieftains that sent their sons regularly to Constantinople. This is very important. It happens many other times in in history. And I think about the Beltiberian nobility sending their youth to be trained in Carthage, or the Germanic ones sending their own to Rome to be. Uh, the imperial bodyguard. So this is, in many ways, the same the same process with not just the the economical interest that naturally was the the main you know motivation behind, but also because of the broader political balance that these uh, aristocracies were starting to acquire, also in, in international terms that you know could interfere here and there. And that these various kingdoms that were taking shape through also the the Russian corridor and with money from here and from there. There were lots of very subtle and complex political games uh, in, in, in regard. Right. Naturally, there were simply a lot of many people that were uh, not noble, but they, they were you know, strong and determined, and they simply wanted to, to make their fortune in Constantinople. They also succeeded uh, in many ways. Uh, the most famous figure in here is, without uh, doubts, Harald Sigurdsson, right, and that was the, the, the Saint youngest brother of, of Saint Olaf, the, the king of Norway, right, and becoming king of Norway uh, himself, and you know, think about just his 
that at Stanford page in 1066 as you know the, even the, the the embodiment of of the end of the tragic destiny of you know the Germanic sagas the Nor Norse sagas of this of the great warrior puts an end in fact to the Viking era ideally that you know had spent his life fighting across all the Mediterranean against the most different enemies and having gotten possibly the, the single best military education of the time he had started uh, at uh, 23 years old allegedly because he admired the might of the Romans right these uh, peoples were extremely sensitive to the to the greatness of empires it was a magic mystic uh, religious also superstitious ideal that you know the big empire was the one from which you know the big gods stood right and he joined with uh, initially from this 500 men from from the Ukraine uh, the Varangian guard uh, and th these guys essentially spoke mainly Norse. This was a problem also for, you know, the translation was in a specific office and title were attached for this. Uh, he served essentially from 1035 to 1044, right? As we have seen, commanding um, his contingents uh, in Sicily uh, and in Anatolia as well. So fully framed within the uh, Byzantine military uh, organization, drill, uh, command, uh, and so on. Then, as we'll see in the uh, next time, there was this other wave of uh, mainly British, uh, mainly Anglo-Saxon elements, uh, Anglo-Danish elements that were uh, that started to join the guard from 1066 afterwards. Also, to have their chance to fight against the Normans that now were fastly rising from, from Sicily as the, the major threat to the Empire easily, right? You know, the major threat weren't the Seljuks anymore at that point. They were, they were crumbling. The, 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 the most capable, uh, you know, and dangerous and dynamic threat were the Sicilian Normans that in many ways had emerged from that same hummus, right? From that same background, from that same uh, military a practice that had seen the, 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 their own employment in in southern Italy between the Longobards, the the, the Byzantines, the the Arabs, and so on, right? And all this mills. Think about all the you know this this the life of these people, all the various individual experiences, all the uh, also in the familial connections. As we have seen, these weren't kind of nuclear uh, individuals. There were entire families, entire clans, right? That joined entire bands, uh, groups that were part of something else that had already been forming around the world, right? Gravi started to gravitate around the empire. And speaking of their organization, in fact, we unfortunately don't know much, right? We don't clearly understand how the Varangian Guard was composed, right? Nor where, in the first place, the Norsemen were transformed from... Um, you know, this elite and non-elite uh, mercenary unit on the field into the Byzantine Emperor's personal guard. And we have, generally speaking, just hints about it. Uh, for example, regarding Vladimir's help to Basil II, Sallus refers that, uh, you know, Basil selected a just a part of them, implicitly, uh, of this Tower of Scythians, as they were called, the Rus, um, in, in Volker, uh, uh, creating essentially a, di a division out of them, with other, together with other foreign troops. So this, first of all, speaks of, uh, properly of a selection. So that was the creation of the elite. Those 6,000 men were, generally speaking, an army, as variegated and uh, you know stratified as it could be, Basil takes the, the best of them with some strong criteria, like the one could be in the Byzantine army, were quite harsh, and also, you know, including other foreign troops together with them. And literally, you know, uh, maybe we didn't stress this enough, but the, the enormous military experience that derived also from uh, the Byzantine military service was not just about fighting against lots of other peoples, but fighting alongside, basically every uh, as we've seen before every single people the byzantines fought fought within the byzantine army itself 
each and every one of them. So this meant when we say, ah, oh, you know, the Byzantines, you know, fought with in this style that it was like these other peoples. No, probably, you know, those units were those other peoples. Literally, that was a Byzantine tradition since a long time. Of course, the Byzantines were able to replicate that themselves artificially, but most of the times was much cheaper, right, and good enough to hire lots of other people. Think about the the swarms of Pachinex, for example, of, of Kumans that were hired this time, and enormity, in the range of thousands and thousands, and all these people brought their own specific military techniques, tactics, mindset, mentality, and it was just this extremely effervescent system that in fact made of the Byzantine army those entries, some you know, finest military machines ever seen in the world. Um, then we have uh, from the Tactica of Nikephoros Uranos, right, that wrote towards the, the end of the 10th century, um, that uh, the the Basil II brought properly uh, the the Ross together with him in the, the Bulgarian campaigns, and th these were a special unit, right? And here, uh, I think in, in two passages, he mentions specifically that the Ross were together with the archers and heavily armed troops, always accompanying Basil, right? And he also states that the Ross themselves were used both as infantry and sometimes even as cavalry. This is very important because we have evidence of the Russian cavalry, in, for example, in Georgia in, in the, that incident in year 1000. Um, we, we have it also for the Battle of, of Petra in 1057, in which at least some Varangians fought on horseback. Um, we have some information about the fact that the Russians preferably uh, fought dismounted, right? This is something that, uh, you know, if you know Anglo-Saxon or Viking military history, it's a, you know, hotly debated topic that we're hinting at before, actually, about the, the actually cavalry capability. I have never believed, not even once, that... Uh, I don't know, the Anglo-Saxons, for example, because at least for the Vikings, it's documented, so you know, just I have to mention the source um, in, in that specific context. Uh, but the Anglo-Saxons actually fought on horseback, right? Maybe they didn't have the same... Surely they didn't have a feudal system like the Franks. They didn't have a, you know, a robust, structurally systematic, you know, heavily armored, uh, you know, capability like like uh, the, the Carolingians and their successors, but it's, it's simply silly to believe that they didn't fight on horse. Of course they did. Actually, we have the evidence of that, right? You know, also late Anglo-Saxon times, if you look at Harold Godwinson, he fought basically as a Norman in Normandy on horseback. He fought as an Anglo-Saxon on foot in England. He fought actually mounted in, 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 in Wales, and showing an adaptability that that point was kind of normal. The Scandinavians that are, you know, massively also influenced the Anglo-Saxon military traditions, uh, you know, had seen it all. They they crossed Russia, they crossed the Ukraine, they met the Pechenegs, right? They fought against the Seljuks, right? Peoples coming from, from Central Asia originally, some of the finest equestrian cultures. And of course, they knew how to fight on horseback well themselves. They might have not have the degree of, of a collective training. Uh, Scandinavia was not a feudal country. They didn't have maybe the, uh, just, the, of course, like the Anglo-Saxons, this heavily armored uh, cavalry on a, on a, you know, with this in, very intense collective training that in the Vassalitic beneficiary system of Frankish origin was, you know, dramatically more advanced. But, of course, we know since the 7th century, you know, in, in the sagas, the hero is always accompanied by this horse. He always runs the world with that, you know. Great individual training, poor collective training, but generally speaking, fine horsemen in their own regard. And at this time, especially by the end of the, the Viking era, especially for these military professionals that toured the world in this fashion and fought alongside Western Franks uh, with the Byzantines that at this time had one of the most devastating military units of cavalry, the Klippanophoroi, that were you know, mastering, even just in terms of military technology equipment, of training, you know, some of you know, the, the greatest feats in the question of military culture. And all these other peoples of the steppes, right, uh, the 
at the northeastern borders of the eastern borders of, of the Byzantine Empire, of course, learned how to do it, right, alongside with others, because actually these sources here prove that, uh, like, there weren't just the Varangians, and of course, it would have been even dangerous to entrust everything to them, right, of course, there were picked units that, uh, especially in forms of properly of the Imperial Bodyguard, of course, were, you know, uh, very close to him, as we will see now, but also not so immense, so that they could take over. For example, uh, there was here a properly Byzantine army, which was was a uh, was a hell of, a, of an army. And but this fact of mounting and dismounting, th this is fascinating because it tells that, preferably speaking, think about the Anglo-Saxons. You know, they they would prefer to fight on foot to still meet heavy cavalry and and here where you know uh, the, you know the the, pr the primacy of heavy cavalry in the field starts affirming itself properly by the 12th century it's mostly during the 13th century it's never contested right but already by the 11th century look at hastings you know infantry were still capable of folding and even making fail cavalry charges right uh cavalry was increasing in importance no doubt thanks to the spread of feudalism, then in part will invest also Constantinople in, in a different margin, but still sometimes also with literally Western Europeans settled everywhere in this regard, it's probably imported as Western cavalrymen because they they needed these people. We have seen it. It was happening everywhere. It was happening in Hungary. It was happening. People coming from everywhere, Germany, France, England, Spain, Italy, everywhere, right, that, were, that Frankish model had taken root and these professionals were were developing as such, and and it's all a bit, you know, spreading further, thanks also to the Normans in England and in Sicily and so on. But you you get what we mean, in here. Regarding numbers, actually, we know much less. We did, we have a fairly greater uh, documentation for later centuries. Today we don't look at. We know of the six thousand men in nine hundred eighty nine and nine hundred ninety. Uh, we know again of the same number. Uh, ten years later, as we've seen before, and it seems that throughout all this time there were at least, uh, you know, uh, three thousand. Let's put it in this way: Varangians, uh, regularly employed uh, in, in that function within the imperial army, plus lots of people that we can't properly fit, in fact, in in the Varangian guard, and that's in fact the, the, the proper problem. Naturally, all these units were were kind of. Uh, like, these weren't properly permanent units, right? You know, the institution as such, the idea of the, the function was there, of course, it was a greater, a great continuity of this unit that was, took even roots in Byzantine politics and society, in Constantinople especially, so that still in four, by 1453, someone that could be called a Barangian, right, technically speaking. Um, but, um, of course, we're talking about pre pre-modern systems, these guys didn't have, like, there wasn't a, uh, a, a standard organic, right? So, the thing fluctuated a lot. The money varied, the people changed. We know something, however, fairly precisely about the command structure, right? The commander of the Varangian Guard was the Akolutos, right? Literally, the follower in Greek. It means, essentially, the nearest person to the emperor, right, on formal occasions, but also in uh, in general at court, this officer originally came from the imperial uh, Vigla. It was one of, of the Tagmata regiments of the imperial guard, right? Uh, it's possible, by the way, that, uh, you know, that properly the, the Varangian guards was inserted in the Etaireia, that, you know, it's the, the name, the Byzantine use was the, the guards of Alexander the Great, right? And uh, this was one of the, the, the unit regiments. It's possible that Varangians were there, right? Uh, we, we, we talk about the Varangian guard as, as, as a historiographical name, if you want, a you know, conventional one, but we don't know exactly which you know, uh, organic was framed completely. And the Akolutos was in charge of the foreign of all actually the foreigners in the army right and eventually he specifically took on the command of the new palace regiment 
and this officer was not necessarily a foreigner himself, right? Um, but, however, he had necessarily to, to know how to speak the language of his soldiers, for which either he simply knew that by, by himself, or he uh, made use of an interpreter. The Acolotus was simply one uh, of, of the most important, if, if not actually the most important, imperial officer. Right, He actually kept uh, the keys of Constantinople given by the emperor when he, he was absent, right? Eventually, by later times, the, the title would decline, but at, at this point, uh, it, wa it was prominent. The interpreters of the Varangians were themselves under sp a specific officer known as the Megalo the, uh, the Hermeneutes, right? A grand interpreter that was an official, also this case of important rank, uh, with, uh, having at this service junior officers known as primi carioi. These titles, you know, the titles and offices at the Byzantine court is, uh, is a nightmarish topic. <laughs> you know, it's something that changes dramatically. We know we know a lot quantitatively, but it's all messed up. You know, and no, I will not even dare to enter into the specificities. Maybe one day with a lot of calm. But uh, the important, though, is that um, these figures uh, related to the guards, the foreign guard, remained prominently inside during this time. Uh, the, there was even a seemingly a sort of body of guardsmen uh, emulating the ancient lictors of Rome, uh, called uh, the Mangla Vitae, right? That properly were, you know, the lictors, as you know, were the the bodyguards of the Roman magistrates, so the people that literally, you know, were all around uh, the, the 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 very important person, and you know, trying to to take uh, you know a step in, in their place because that was fundamentally their job. Um, these troops uh, were equipped with a club specifically in in Byzantine times, and a or a golden whip, and they were carried, in fact. Uh, to clear the way during an imperial procession, right? So that actually the imperial regiment would have its, its way open by these means of clubs and whips, and it's quite fascinating. Um, these troops were commanded by a protos patarius, that is the first of the sword bearers as a as a court rank uh, officer of high uh, level, and. We say this because Harald Ortrada himself actually covered both the office of Manglavitas, right, and eventually the one of Spataro Candidatos, right, that was, uh, I presume, the wingman of the Protospatarius. And one famous Acolutos is, was the, the guy we mentioned before for the clash against the Seljuks, was this Mikhail slash Michael mentioned in the uh, Silitz, um, Silitz manuscript in the war in 1050-53, actually um, against the Pachinex, but the episode, of, I think it's the same guy of the episode, in fact, of the, of the Turks, which commanded, as we have seen, both the Russo-Varangians and the Franks, that received important titles that more than you know, standardized office reveal actually the, the greatness of the individual because he was called as uh, in different times as antipatos that was basically the equivalent of the proconsul so a major also military figure or to be in, to which he was entrusted in fact imported military military uh, missions like the one against the Seljuks against the the, the Pachinex uh, before uh, as we've seen in these years. Uh, then eventually Patricios, which is a title that was used, as you know, uh, in late Roman times to define, to appoint actually, usually kind of barbarian uh, military commanders in a, you know, in a Romanizing fashion could kind of have them uh, integrated into the, the in, in, formally slash informally into the Roman government. 
Acolutus, that is the follower, as we've seen before, and probably Anthropos, that is the man of, of the emperor, right? So, like a factotum, basically. Um, this makes you understand the true, this individual, that we, we really don't know where he came from. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, the true him, the, the troops that he commanded surely had an equally important rank overall, right? We have other figures uh, like these for later times. We'll talk about it on another occasion. Speaking of standards and flags, it seems that the Varangian Guard was associated to another uh, unit of the Imperial Guard uh, that was much older, that, that is the Excubitores, that you know, well, actually, were very old. Uh, it's a terminology that comes from uh, late uh, Roman times, at least for designating these guards' units. There were, the the Varangians were seemingly even stationed closely to the uh, to the place where the excubitores resided in Constantinople, uh, some have suggested they may have replaced the excubitores themselves, but more likely, probably they coexisted. And what is interesting about that is that the um, this unit, uh, uh, the, the 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 old excubitores were represented at some point with a draco standard. Uh, a dragon, the dragon head, even here for a, a reminiscence of the migration era, that actually was quite common at the time. Um, that is, this uh, hollow bronze sculpture of a dragon head, uh, in which was inserted t tubular windsock, right, with this colored silk sections stitched together, often embroidered. It was an important, uh, very important standard, and it, it was com very common all over, still central. Um, Eastern Europe, right? The, the last Draco, I think, in, in, in Western military history is recorded in Germany by the 13th century. So very late in time. And uh, therefore, there's been a, a connection between uh, the possible import of the Draco by these Norse mercenaries. Uh, a link has been drawn also by the Draco that is depicted in the Bayeux tapestry uh, being carried by the Anglo-Saxon house cars of Harald Godwinson. And uh, there is also uh, an image carved into an external wall uh, of the 11th century church of Mesopotamia, modern-day uh, Albania, uh, an area which uh, later to the period we see today, but, you know, fairly close, still in the 11th century, uh, the English Varangians, the Anglo-Saxon refugees, played an important role in the resistance to the Norman attacks to Epirus, right, uh, in those years. And it's been suggested even in there that this may be uh, a broader connection with this Nordic and the steppes world more than else. You know that the Draco was imported in, uh, let's say, uh, was present among, for example, the Dacians, but it was mostly this, this banner of the steppes, right, that was reinjected heavily uh, during the migration era in Europe, but it is to be found in, in the Roman army, basically everywhere, um, in the Germanic peoples, and all, in all this area. So, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, I have a specific opinion about this, that is, yes, this connection is wholly plausible, but here we are possibly even underestimating how spread these banners were, in the sense that it might have not been necessarily a, a, a Norse link that brought them there, right? It might have been also used by other steps. Peoples might have been used uh, still by the same Byzantine army, as far as we are, we are concerned, right? I don't think there is a dramatic proof of this, but it's still an hypothesis that can't be ruled out. And it's also something that was used, in fact, as we have seen in Central Europe. Uh, so it, it wouldn't be strange, after all, to, you know, in this much very connected world, uh, interconnected world, as you understand that maybe that um, Albanian dragon was, was there for, for some other reason, rather than just the Varangians, right? But the, the, the link is, is well possible. Um, the Varangians, as we were saying before, were mostly stationed within Constantinople to keep the, the city and the emperor naturally secure, and also, as we've seen, they accompanied uh, the the sovereign uh, on campaign uh, on a regular base, but we find Varangians also 
employed in um, fort garrisons or on maritime duties, right? And it's even possible, actually, that thematic varangians existed, that is, essentially units that lived and served permanently in the provinces of the Byzantine Empire, you know, settled as lots of other peoples were settled at the time and that didn't have any connection with the, with the guard, right? They were simply people that came from, from Russia, from Scandinavia, and that they settled in, in the empire, right? Maybe, of course, uh, through the same, uh, you know, service, you know, maybe after, you know, the, the, a lifetime of campaigns that they were given land that we've seen Basil II actually uh, promoted this uh, middle uh, class property to you know to to re revive to be revived uh, against the abuses of the prevaricatory enlargement of the private latifundia right so what's best than you know settling uh, along uh, the provinces former veterans that you know can you know, keep even at bay physically because they know the craft of, of war, uh, the the private retinues of the great Byzantine landlords, right? So we have to imagine actually a, a much larger amount of Varangians uh, settled in the Byzantine Empire aside from the guard. And as we have seen, Varangians were sent to fight basically everywhere throughout the Byzantine territories. Uh, we find them in, in Trace, uh, we find them together with the Franks uh, in winter quarters in Chaldea, we find them in Macedonia, uh, we find them in a lot of places actually, and you know, also in later times compared to, to our own. So this is pretty, pretty well documented. Another interesting aspect uh, is the um, capacity of putting down revolts. Right, of operating uh, as some kind of mobile mobile guards. For example, by the 11th century, there is um, a guardsman called Ragnvald uh, that uh, was stationed with a detachment of regular troops in Greece. This might have been actually native Byzantines, but to keep order, and he may be even connected with the famous uh, Pinos lion that uh, you know has runes famously. Uh, in, uh, sizzled uh, on it that was from Athens and exactly from, from those years and that is the, the one that, um, that the Venetians took away after the Fourth Crusade that is in fact uh, in Venice today uh, to see publicly and other scholars believe actually that those inscriptions on the lion are uh, have been carved by some Varangian guards accompanying Basil II during his triumph in to Athens in 1018 after the Bulgarian War. But I would say one of the most fascinating uh, aspects in absolute terms is how the Byzantines employed Varangians as pirates, right, uh, in order to suppress other pirates. Right. This this could happen as literally employing them since the, the 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 beginning as okay you know instead of raiding here I pay you to go clash against someone else. This is what for example the Carolingians did against you know between Western Francia and, and Eastern Francia, even if mostly on land in that case. Uh, but later on, probably being entrusted part of the imperial navy, um, or at least sent his smaller detachments, but however still you know with the with the mandate. Of uh, of the state to crush mostly uh, piracy and what's best of crushing piracy, but pirates like the, the Vikings were. There are several sources confirming this. For example, the same Harald Ardrada was uh, said by the uh, one saga at least to have been paid uh, 100 marks uh, for every pirate vessel he was able to capture uh, by the emperor himself. And that, however, could keep also the rest. So he was prepaid fundamentally for, for the task in case, you know, he had not uh, captured this. So it's a, it's a regular naval, naval service. And also we know that uh, Varangian guards were stationed in uh, important naval centers such as Paphos in Cyprus. And later on we have evidence of um, of even uh, Varangian and Venetian cooperation later on. Um, we know, unfortunately, a few 
about the employment of the Varangian Guard in battle proper. Like, we don't know wh which battle formations they and tactics the Varangians uh, had, and probably they didn't vary uh, as much, you know, from the rest of the Byzantine ones. Uh, we have, of course, the the idea of the elite infantry, you know, in a mostly defensive function, chiefly, you know, to stand against some of the most ferocious attacks, even the ones of cavalry, uh, and also protecting the emperor, logically, because that's, you know, what's a guard for, and mostly as a reserve, therefore, that you or your, keep your elite um, uh, rest until the end of the battle. But actually, we, we know very few about their actual role in the battlefield, and mostly uh, we know of, from the Battle of the Iraqian in 1081, it's not part of our period, but let's say we will have to make a video actually on the battle itself, so we will save um, considerations for, for then, but uh, the, there is an interesting, you know, that the, the Varangians were basically wiped out during the battle, because they initially, there is one source I'm pretty sure about, never studied the thing, but you know, one source at least says that they were uh, operating like opening ranks for letting you know the reserves passing through, which is yeah possible, but not exactly in the way the the source says. Like this, if this this unit split in two uh, halves and left this huge space open. I mean, this is not how you want to to maintain the cohesion of a unit uh, long run. But of course, there were corridors long enough to make other troops pass. But that's kind of a uh, should be understood better what what it really was. What we know, though, is that in, on that occasion the Varangians went uh, too far during the fight and were surrounded and uh, slaughtered to the death. Um, we know more instead about the guard service, generally speaking. The the very elite, of, uh, the, properly the, the bodyguards, naturally participated in all imperial ceremonies and accompanied the emperor everywhere. Uh, they were responsible for guarding the famous bronze doors of the Great Palace, for example, and as well as other imperial properties. They mm, usually controlled his abodes, for example, and they made the guard around uh, the throne during uh, the receptions uh, and so on. We have the famous incisions in uh, Hagia Sophia with the, you know, uh, like Hare uh, was half done was here. Also, there is an Aare. It is a name typical from from Iceland, for example. And so their presence is unequivocal in this context. Uh, the Barangian Guard would be used actually to perform police duties in Constantinople. As a major city, you want to keep the mob under control. And naturally, they weren't liked at all because these were seen as the foreigners that enforced imperial authority. Uh, Constantinople was, was a dynamic city in many ways, was becoming most, most than, more than the mob in itself, but you know, the city was kind of a, uh, made up of all these so-called okayaka that were the, 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 the aristocratic households that controlled like uh, empires, smaller empires on their own with the possessions in the provinces and so on, so these mm, this uh, you can't imagine what a medieval city will, could also could be, you know, the, the difficulty of fighting the streets hand-to-hand, -hand. you know, these troops, you know, being, being well-built, superbly equipped, dramatically trained, were the best uh, also in, in this context. I'd like never underestimate, you know, the risk of uh, fighting in, in, in the streets. I, I'm studying specifically these things recently, and even the elite can be knocked out, so, but generally speaking, they, they knew how to maintain order, right, they, these were, you know, if you really wanted to, to count on someone in those, uh, in those troubled moments, as they, they happened multiple times for emperors to be threatened by rebellions and so on, they, they these were the Varangians, um, and surely, as police, they would also arrest just major figures that, you know, uh, of even high religious or aristocratic status, so there was a lot of tension uh, overall. Uh, there were, the Varangians were also used as jailers, for example. The Varangian guard is considered to have been fanatically loyal to the emperor, but there are certain um, episodes in which they, they also took 
po political side on their own. For example, they were responsible for the rise of the Komnenian dynasty of Alexius I against Nikephoros III about Aniatas. Uh, these guys naturally could read in Byzantine policy and they, they, they acted accordingly. They were extremely well paid, so they had all the interest of securing uh, this substantial amount of gold that would derive from the most likely political side to, to, to take power uh, at some point. And they, they played the thing seemingly uh, pretty well, right? Uh, they received money directly from the, the imperial uh, trunks, so they, they had even the security of a regular uh, pay from the central treasury. And we know even how much they, they they were paid actually that were something between the forty uh, and thirty nomismata that that uh, equate basically to the gold aure right in the West per month, which is an enormous amount actually. And at this time, Byzantine economy was stable. Uh, you know, precious metals were available. In this sense, so this was naturally. Also, the way the, the the imperial army was so well uh, composed by not just by native troops but also people c coming from from everywhere, and you can imagine what it meant for a Scandinavian of the tenth or eleventh century to receive such a huge amount of gold. Uh, as we were saying before, Harald or Trada is considered to, to have been, in fact, the richest man to have ever lived in Scandinavia up to that point, thanks to the, the enormous amount of money he had received. From, from the Byzantines, and that's how you build a kingdom, by the way, <laughs> as became king of Norway, and as you attract clientels of warriors in the Scandinavian policy. We've seen it uh, many times in the videos about the, the Scandinavian uh, armies organizations of the time. Uh, as we have seen before, the uh, Varangians were usually rewarded also uh, in, in addition to their regular wages with spoils of war receiving very large amounts of it we've seen for example under Basil the second after the sack of the Bulgarian capital how they received one third the same proportion is um, to be uh, given after the capture of Longon and the sacking of the Pelagonian fields in 1016 um, and in, on that occasion, the troops are specifically the uh, Simakusi Ros, that means uh, basically the Russian allies, right? So this was something that, uh, you know, with a sheer force that these troops had in the army, you know, if they, in this case, it means that they weren't not, they were not uh, imperial troops, they were mercenaries, allies, which is more or less, it, it's difficult to, to, to draw a difference between what, what it means, you know, uh, in this regard, but that specific case is is also a political measure. You want to pay people also to show, for example, why in, uh, to to the ruling class in their land, where you know the, the might of your power attracting these warriors, things like that. Um, the we know of many other uh, you know freedoms, let's say that uh, were granted to the Varangians, like sacking, devastating. Uh, and keeping uh, the loot for themselves on, on multiple occasions, uh, which is more or less what you know the Vikings did in the first place by themselves were used to, um, and um, there was also all a series of of gifts, um, let's say of gifts that were given to, to the guards for, for whatever political reason, keeping them happier, uh, and so on. And uh, naturally, uh, at the accession of, of a new emperor, this is typical so many other polities. You know, the guardsmen were allowed traditionally to, to raid the, uh, one of, uh, on the emperor's chambers, right? You know, once an emperor dies, you know, all the possessions, uh, spared possessions disappear. And this was granted elsewhere also to the serfs or other figures, by the way. Um, there is... Um, an important, even the, the Byzantine world began fa to be fascinated with these people. So I have, we have seen how they interiorized the, their figure of Northmen, even if maybe they came from somewhere else, and they they actually, uh, you know, stressed the importance of the, the typical 
uh, Roman mindset of the barbarian that was civilized and that you know the empire that managed to control and to exploit you know all these brutal forces that existed outside the perfection of its boundaries uh, for its own ends, its own prestige, its own universal uh, role. And vice versa, we've seen how much the Norsemen were fascinated with the great universal empire of Miklagard, its mighty armies and navies and riches that attracted uh, them and excited their fantasies of conquest, uh, and so on. That really was a great esprit de corps, uh, eventually attached to, to the guards. The Varangians were extremely proud of their position. They uh, they deserved that because actually they were fanatically uh, courageous. Uh, some of the finest troops definitely the Empire could deploy, uh, with whom just a few could compare. Right. We know, however, also of moments of unruliness uh, uh, in many ways, uh, we know, for example, violences that he committed in the same kind of uh, friendly territory. There is a story about uh, the Varan, famously, that is represented also in the, one of the miniatures from the Silicis manuscript um, about um, a campaign um, in in Trace where the, the Varangians tra tried to rape a woman and she, she she refused to suffer the violence and she killed one of the Varangians. And the Varangians were actually impressed by the woman's courage and they uh, they actually rendered had all the possessions that the men who had attempted to rape her uh, owned um, and they didn't bury him. You know, the recent broader Germanic board is idea that, you know, the strength of a woman and of her, you know, uh, of, of this kind of supernatural connections of, of the spirits and sensitivity it, it is a very important thing. So um, th there are episodes of this kind that confirm uh, also these in interesting cultural uh, comparisons. Uh, generally speaking, the, it's not that the Byzantines like the, the foreigners uh, in general. Um, it, the the, the Varangians are also criticized on many occasions. was this obvious idea that... Uh, uh, these were unruly, uh, culturally speaking, that they were cocky, they didn't quite uh, revere the, the authority per se, that they were extremely fanatic. This is a bit the same prejudices that existed um, towards the, the Western mercenaries, right? You know, and, and there would be actually uh, lots of these elements that would enter the same Barangian guards in later times. Um, but we we got to admit that the the Scandinavians, uh, of course, were, and also the Franks later, were, were somewhat, uh, they, they mocked this idea of, of the, the highly, uh, you know, regulated and uh, staged and uh, choreographed uh, Byzantine rituals. They, they they couldn't understand how one man like the emperor could have all this, couldn't share the power. He was put so high. You know, Byzantine... Uh, court ritual was something extremely elaborated. The, 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 em the emperor sat on a throne that was several feet high, you know, over the hours. So, you know, there was um, it was this continuous um, impression that wanted to be given to the, of of an of a an over overrule that crushed all the others. So, so this was incompatible in many ways with the uh, with the egalitarian minded character of the Franks and the Scandinavians before, but. Uh, still, there was a mutual respect, right? Because of the greatness of the Byzantines and because of the, of the valor of the, uh, of the Westerners, let's call them this way. Um, and they, the Saint Varangians became a symbol of the imperial greatness, right? Regarding the lodging of the Varangians, well, um, they. They were scattered, actually, as we've seen, Imperial Palace. There were also other camps close to to the walls where they, they could control access to the city. Sometimes these Varangians were so many, as we've seen, especially when, you know, aside the ones of the guard, probably the, 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 the thousands that existed, that they had to be dispersed uh, in various fortifications in the city. For example, across the Golden Horn at Galata. Um, it seems that initially they, they had the specific sanctuary on their own, also when they weren't uh, properly even Christianized, um, close to, to however other actually Christian places 
of of cult um they 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 liked the things like the circus right they appreciated uh very much uh greek prostitutes uh southern beauties um they they they're stereotypically of course uh, remember for the, this you know the fact that they liked to drink to you know this uh most typical you know uh angovers and uh, fanaticism about this thor like um ways of you know showing off you know who was the toughest guy you know these proofs of force and even you know it could transform them in kind of an unruly way it was a first church dedicated to the russians uh there was saint elias by since the the 11th century then eventually there was one dedicated to saint olaf haraldson right and to the mother of god built not far from Hagia sophia um and the there are lots that eventually there were even others that they became these churches became in fact even a sort of in fact symbolism for for constantinople as a wall rather than just for for the varangians um the the varangians were important for local politics as we've seen also for example they brought uh, again uh, the dowager empress zoe to back to throw right after be, be causing effectively the they were throwing michael v that had wanted to be replaced with um uh, eunuch guards armed the arab style and, and all these things and allegedly harald or rather blinded michael himself uh, and uh, there was uh, there, there is a lot actually now the video is very long I, i will stop it here but this is just for saying how far and wide the influence of these mercenaries went to constantinople by those years how there was extremely fortunate meeting ground we can't say between the, the needs of this uh pirates traders explorers to, to to eventually make a living into an empire that conversely uh needed these um military men that fought by profession on a regular basis vikings as uh you know in this broader space that could allow a, you know a, a lifetime of uh, of action right then it was filled for for the opportunities for trade this is all connected with the revival of intercontinental exchanges the monetization of economy there is really a lot to talk about this reason for which we can't cover everything uh in a in a single video but uh as i was saying at the beginning we will come back on the topic we will talk about the uh varangians in later times and also talk about their equipment and their various uh even tactical specialties and uh capacities uh as far as at least as far as we can derive from from their equipment at some point because as we've seen documentarily speaking we we have actually very few evidence of how they fought how they were organized we can assume it right this video was just mostly about their organization their uh, establishment as a as a bodyguard and, and a lot there will be um, uh, naturally also on the kevin rus and how you know from properly the russian side of the story that is often overlooked and that instead led to amazing developments in their own kind and also this uh you know this initial contrast naturally between the rus and constantinople that is fascinating because it brought eventually to to the broader uh con- orthodox connection and alliance and therefore also the, the repartition of specific areas of influence and all the various um also international you know uh common goals that these peoples had in many ways but once again we will talk about it next time or not at times as you know i have a byzantine history playlist i have a roman warfare playlist in which i think it makes both the uh, i mean it's all roman but you know it's both the, the roman more conventionally roman and the, the, the also conventionally byzantine period um and also there is something about medieval russia and i don't think i will include this video in medieval russia but still uh it's connected to that and i talked about the byzantine russian relations and we'll keep doing that as well but for now i just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time
Bye.